Good morning. Um, before we we start, I just wanted to um, again communicate uh, the same things that I did last time that I was uh, worshiping with you and bringing a lesson to you, and that is how much I appreciate uh, this opportunity to speak to you from God's Word. I appreciate uh, the invitation from uh, the elders. Uh, but both times that I've I've done this. Uh, uh, it's it's interesting when you tune in to people that you, you haven't really met and they don't know you. Uh, just kind of see how they interact with each other. Both times I've been um, uh, encouraged. I've appreciated seeing all the hellos at the very beginning uh, before you start your your worship. It's nice to see uh, that you are a group that uh, of Christians that love each other, and you can see the. Uh, the, the desire to be with one another uh, again. We, we hope and we pray that uh, that will be happening. I know everyone across uh, the country and even across California are um, you know, staggering as they come back uh, to worship here at Clovis. Uh, we started a public worship uh, th this morning, actually, uh, and have... Um, uh, a couple of services that are going on every Sunday, and they're going to be doing that for a while. And I know other places are doing that. So I pray for, for you and your area that that will uh, happen uh, sooner rather than later. Um, we look at situations like this uh, that we currently find ourselves in, and it's very easy to take uh, a negative approach. You know, we want to... Um, be with brethren. Uh, we want our lives, our day-to-day -day routine. We're comfortable with that. Uh, and when it's not there, when it's taken away from us, it, it's challenging. And yet, as Christians, I think it gives us an opportunity to re-examine uh, some things and to refocus uh, on some things that maybe uh, in our thinking, they, they get kind of pushed back. Uh, to the back of our mind, or we don't necessarily think about it as much. And so it's a good opportunity uh, to re-examine what is the, the church. Uh, the church is not the building. Uh, what does it mean to have uh, fellowship with brethren uh, and, and things like that? Now, with that uh, positive lesson that we can gain from uh, the, the challenge of, uh, of a pandemic. I think we can also um, fail to continue uh, those things as we move back to some sense of normalcy in our lives. And that is the temptation is to return back to normal. And I don't think that that is what we necessarily want to find ourselves doing. So, um, it's something to keep in mind as we start this morning's lesson. Um, let's go ahead and put up the, the first slide. I have a question on the, the first slide I want you to think about, and that is, what are some of the greatest challenges that congregations today currently encounter and must conquer uh, if they are to exist? What, what I mean by, by asking that question is we need to reflect that there is uh, a trend in the church uh, that is uh, it's a little startling. Uh, when you look at numbers, there's definitely a decrease in size of local congregations and number of local congregations. And uh, obviously, as Christians, we don't want to see that happen. But there are a number of things that contribute to what we are seeing uh, nationally and even globally. Uh, concerning faith. Now, ultimately, I'm a firm believer what God promised in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, that, that God would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. The church is always going to be here. Uh, the, the Christians are always going to be here, but what it's going to look like might be different unless we look at ourselves. And so let's go ahead and put up the, the next slide with the, the first uh, four points. We can talk about the, the challenge of morality. I, I think you would agree with me that when we look at our culture, 
uh, our society that there is definitely a shift in what people view as moral and immoral, what they view as acceptable and unacceptable. And the, the, the thing that we as Christians need to be aware of is that while we are to be an influence in the world, oftentimes we become influenced by the world. And, and so we have to look at the world's morality and ask, you know, does that necessarily harmonize with God's? And we see this in, in many different forms of what society accepts as normal as uh, good behavior or acceptable behavior. And so we have to talk about the question of morality and worldliness. And then there's the challenge of authority, which is the next point. And, and that is something that the church always will face and never ceases. You know, from Acts chapter 15, uh, we have the question of authority of should should Gentiles be circumcised in addition to baptism in order to be saved? And what do they do? They gather together in Acts chapter 15 in Jerusalem, and they discuss the things that God had revealed, whether it be direct statement or by example, or people relate their experiences. The question of authority is not one that has been... Uh, in the minds of Christians and the Lord's Church in the 40s and 50s and 60s of this era. Uh, it is always there. The problem of institutionalism, the problem of why we do what we do is always there. So that's a challenge that we also have to overcome. The next challenge is that of our, our families. Uh, there are tremendous failures uh, in the homes. Again, we see that in society, and we see it sadly within the Lord's people. There's just a failure in the home where, you know, men are not what men ought to be, and women are not what God wants women to be, and uh, the, 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 the solid foundation of God's Word as, as that which directs our homes is turning our homes upside down, and we become very dysfunctional. Uh, then there's the challenge of apostasy. Uh, as as a uh, as a gentleman who you know I'm married, I have three kids. My youngest just graduated high school this this last week. I am concerned about what we are seeing with young people. Uh, young people are leaving the church. One of the fastest growing designations of people, young people in the world today, are called the nuns. That is, they do not affiliate with religion at all. And so we have to look and say, okay, we're losing our children to the world. And you can see uh, in studies, there's numerous statistics about how many children are turning away from uh, religion, Christianity, but more specifically, leaving the Lord's church. I think those are just four of many issues that have the power to damage and to destroy a local congregation. One of the greatest challenges I want us to think about this morning is the challenge of inactivity. And that's the, the next point, the challenge of inactivity. In congregations, no matter what size a congregation is, whether it's 20, 60, 100, or 200, there are always going to be some that tend towards inactivity rather than activity. They are disengaged, if you would, in their, the practice of their faith. There are those, and you know this as well as I do, that put little effort, little thought, uh, and time into their spiritual life. They don't want to develop a closer relationship with God. There are those that are disengaged that, you know, what they do as a Christian within a local congregation is very minimal, if existent at all. And some of that is because we're, we become content with uh, our relationship with our brethren. We don't want it to grow or progress, and we're fine the way we are. And then there's another reason why we become disengaged, and that is uh, 
we, we go through the motions. And that is because we are content with letting others do the work. Now we might ask the question, why is that a problem? Because what they say tends to be, uh, you know, 20% uh, do 80% of the work and 80% do 20% of the work. Why is that a problem in a local congregation? And I think it goes beyond just the, the life cycle of a congregation and it trending towards, uh, you know, non-existence. But more importantly, it denies what Christ has recreated us for. Not what he created us for, and that's for all mankind. But what he has recreated us, those that were lost and then brought to life, what he has cre recreated us for is for good works. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and, and not of your own selves. It is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship created for what? Good works. If we don't act in our lives as Christians, if there's no actions, if there are no works, James chapter 2, that are motivated by faith, then what we're doing is we're denying what Christ has created us to be by his blood. We have denied sanctification and uh, being redeemed. But it also has denied what he has called us to. Earlier, you, you had on, on your screen, Titus chapter 2, and in verse 14, it says, he gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his possession, who are what? Zealous for good works. He's created us for works, and he has called us to works. So if we don't work, then we are not being identified with Christ, are we? So maybe we have to ask the question, how do we become disengaged? I think we become disengaged in, in a number of different ways, but one way we see in the, in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 19 with Elijah, was that of discouragement. Elijah just became discouraged. It was right after the victory on uh, Mount Carmel against the, the priests of Baal. God establishes this great victory and Elijah's life is threatened by someone else, by Jezebel. Now, there are times where what we say or what we don't say can cause a brother or sister in Christ to become disengaged because they are discouraged. And so on, on a side point, it's always important to evaluate as one who is offering words and, for one, and one that is hearing those words to evaluate what the words are and how they affect. But you know, there's another source of discouragement. And really, I think this is the primary source of discouragement. The secondary one is what people may say or do to us. But that doesn't affect us unless this becomes an issue. And that is discouragement comes from what we say to ourselves. I, I have on my, my phone, I have um, uh, the, this little uh, saying, it's a lyric from a song that, and it's nothing can kill a man faster than his own head, than his own thinking. What do we say to ourselves? Our self-talk. And you can see how that is the primary, because if someone criticizes me and it's destructive, I can allow that to infiltrate my head and affect me and become discouraged and disengaged. But that only happens if I allow it to enter into my head, if I take it to heart. Now, there, there's a place for constructive criticism. That's not what we're talking about. 
Now, the point is this. In Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, we come across a scene, which this is going to be our text for this morning, for the rest of this morning. We come across a scene in which God is going to call Moses to go to Egypt to bring the children of Israel up out of slavery. And Moses, I would suggest, has become incredibly discouraged. He has allowed Pharaoh to discourage him. In, in chapter 2 and verse 15, uh, Pharaoh makes the, the promise that he is going to kill Moses. He is going to put Moses to death. And, and yes, that, that would be very discouraging if you had someone chasing after you. But I also want us to know that Moses discouraged Moses. Because Moses, when we look in the New Testament, we discover that Moses is having a hard time harmonizing what it is he believed God wanted versus reality. In Acts chapter 7, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand but they did not understand. And so, you know, after he killed this, this, the, the slave master, the very next day, he breaks up the brethren. They said, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill us like you did that? And, and he's like, well, wait a second. You're supposed to follow me. That's what his thinking was. Now, why he thought that, I think we can speculate, but it would just be speculating. So Moses runs. And he goes to Midian, and there we have him enter into the, the next stage of his life, where he becomes disengaged. And it's in this place where God meets him. And in our scripture reading, we have God meeting him in the burning bush. And what God does is God says, okay, Moses, I want you to go and bring out my children. I want you to bring them out of slavery. And what we'll notice is that Moses used every excuse he could think of to keep from doing what God wanted him to do. But God would always provide the answer. So let's go ahead and we'll click forward to the, the title screen. One of the times in which God speaks to Moses, he asks Moses this question. Moses, what's in your hand? And while God was talking literally, I think there is an application for us, and that is what do we have that we can bring to the work of God, whether it be in San Jose or whether it be in Clovis or any other congregation, what can we bring that God can use? Because we struggle. We struggle. So let's look at the, the four excuses of Moses, and then I want to sum up exactly what the problem was with Moses. The very first excuse that Moses offers is in chapter 3 and verse uh, 1 down through verse 12, really about verse 7 through verse 12. And it is this, Moses struggled with identity. He asked the question in verse 11, so Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel up out of Egypt? Now look further, because that's Moses' conclusion to what God had already said. In verse 7, the Lord says to him, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go. I want you to think about this for a moment, and that is Moses was confused about who was going to be doing the work. 
in verse 10, God says, Moses, I'm going to send you. But prior to that, in verse 7 through verse 9, notice the word that's prominent. I have seen the affliction of my people, the Lord says. I have come down to deliver them. I have also seen the oppression. I will send you. See, while Moses fixated on, Moses, I'm going to send you, Moses didn't hear the rest of what God said, and that was that God was going to be doing the work, not Moses. Moses was going to be sent, but God was going to be working through Moses. Now, like Moses, we struggle with identity. We say to ourselves, who am I? What can I do in the Lord's work? And what we forget is this. While we're involved, we're instruments. God is the one that works. Was it the Apostle Paul says? I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. And, and what's amazing about this, I, I don't know if we think about it this way. The burning bush was, was literal. What happened? You have a bush that was, was on fire but not burning. Now, here's what's interesting about that, and that is this. Any normal bush would be burning, right? There's a metaphor that's here that we miss. Any normal bush would burn, but it was the fire of God within that bush that kept it from burning. It was God's work that kept the bush from burning, not the bush's work. And likewise, it wasn't Moses that would sustain Moses. It was God that would sustain Moses when God was within Moses, working through Moses. And like that with us, it's not us that sustains the work. It's God working through us that allows it to not become corrupted or on fire or consumed. The divine flame is what prevents the bush from being consumed. The divine flame within us is what allows us to do the work. So number one, Moses struggled with identity. Number two, Moses struggled with insufficiency. In verse 13, Moses says, if I come to the people of Israel, say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? So Moses said, what's his name? What do I tell them? Moses wanted an excuse. And the excuse he offers the second time is, I don't know enough. I don't know your name. And notice God's answer in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am has sent, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also says, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. In a way, what God is saying to Moses is, Moses, it's not about what you know. It's about who you know. God identifies himself. Now, like Moses, we struggle with that same concept of insufficiency. In, in my experience as, as a preacher, I have encountered many people who have said, I would do more. I would talk to my neighbor. I would talk to my friend. I would talk to my coworker. I would do more, but I just don't know enough. Have you heard people say that before? I just don't know enough. And I want to challenge you because there is a sense, yes, in which our levels of learning are different. But I want to ask you, do you know what counts? Moses says, I don't know. Who is this? And God says, 
This is who I am. And that was enough. Do you know why you believe there's a God? Do you know why you believe the Bible is God's word? Do you know why you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you know what it was that you did to obey the gospel and to become a Christian? If you do, then you know what you can tell people. You don't need to know, you know, in, in a conversation to, to people, you know, the, the different theories on the book of Revelation's date. You don't know, need to know all the details of every stop that the Apostle Paul took on his first journey, his second journey, his third journey. Now, those are important to, for us and to grow and, and to know, but if we're going to talk to someone about the gospel, if you're going to share Jesus with someone, all you have to do is share what you know. And then if there's other things that person has, then you can seek outside information from other people or other sources. See, when God wants you to do something, he doesn't want us to worry about what we don't know, but to be thankful for who we do know, and that's him. Thirdly, Moses struggled with inadequacy. Now we jump over to chapter 4, and in verse 1, Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. And I emphasize uh, the word you. Uh, I, I don't know how Moses it said it, but in some ways, maybe Moses just viewed himself just as a Midianite shepherd. They'll, they're going to tell me, the Lord didn't appear to you. Who are you? Who was he to go to Egypt? Who was he to go and declare, I'm on a mission from God? Who was he to do that? Why should they listen to him? Why should his brethren listen to him? Why should Pharaoh listen to him? What did he have to offer now, remember our first point, God already stated, Moses, what you have to offer is me working through you. But Moses wasn't either fully convinced or completely understanding about that. So what God does is God gives object lessons. And this is what happens in, in verse 2. He asks the question, Moses, what's in your hand? And, and uh, Moses says uh, it's a rod or a staff, but God says cast it down and turn it into a snake. And Moses is a fearful, and then God asks him to take it back up, and, and he doesn't turn it back into the staff. And then God gave him a second work, and that was put your hand into your cloak and then take it out and turn leprous. And then when he put it back in the cloak and took it back out, then it became whole and, and healthy. And then finally, if that wasn't enough for people to believe, he says, take some water from the Nile, pour it out on dry land, and it would be turned to blood, which was previous to the first of, of the plagues. I think in some ways we struggle like Moses. We say, what, what do we have to offer? And we have to ask ourselves the initial question, what's in your hand? We have relationships. We can submit those to God. The power of influence, encouraging one another, encouraging uh, those that are Christians, uh, reaching out to those that are in our circle of relationships and communicate to them the gospel. Be an example. We have time to submit our time to God, allow him to use it for his glory, redeem the days, we're told in the book of Ephesians, because the days are evil. We have talents. We have abilities. We look at Romans chapter 12, verse 5 through verse 8. There are things that are, are just natural to us that maybe we excel in. And Romans 12 gives a list of some of those things. We see the parable of the talents, and while it's talking about money in Matthew chapter 25, Oftentimes, we relate that to our abilities. We have things that we can allow God to use for his glory. We have treasure that is God's, 
that he has made us stewards of that we can use for him. What do we have? I think it's important for us as Christians to evaluate that and then to make the decision, the goal, to use those things for, for God. And then in chapter 4 and verse 10, we have the, the fourth of Moses' excuses. And I think we're very familiar with this one. Moses says, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your spirit, uh, servant, but I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Chapter 4 and verse 10. Now, I don't know if this is actual or made up. I don't know if it matters, to be, to be honest. I do know Moses had the finest education growing up in Pharaoh's household, that he would be competent. But that was a long time ago. Maybe he lost his ability shepherding sheep. But he was forgetting what we often forget. God's not going to ask us to do a work that God does not equip us to do. God's response to Moses, verse 11. God says to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Who has made him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? What God told Moses, Moses, I know exactly what you can do. I made you. And God made every one of us. And he knows what we can do. He knows if we're a five-talent man or, or a two-talent man or a one-talent man. He knows what we can do. Like Moses, we struggle with inability. We say, I'm just not able to do it. God's given us what we need. In Ephesians chapter 4, well, actually back up in chapter 3, God has given us a word that we can understand. In chapter 4, Christ gave to the church the gifts of the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. God has given us what we need. Did you notice something? In all of Moses' excuses, God's answer was always the same. It was voiced differently, but the essence of the answer was always the same, and that's this. Moses, I am the solution to your fears and to your concerns. I'm the solution. He tells Moses, you know, when Moses had the identity issue, Moses, I'm going to do the work. You're going. I'm working through you. When it was, uh, I'm insufficient, I don't know who you are. God says, you know me, Moses. And when Moses felt that he was inadequate, that he, he just, that they're not going to listen to him, he's nobody, he's just a Midianite shepherd, God says, it doesn't matter, it's me. And when Moses struggled with his inabilities, God says, I know who you are, Moses, and I can work through you. And it's here where something changes. God in verse 12 of chapter 4 says, Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you will speak. But he, that is Moses, said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. And then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. God's okay when we struggle with in identity, insufficiency, inadequacy, inability. He answers that. Moses, his true problem, his true struggle, his true problem is attitude. He just did not want to do it. And that's when God says, Moses, no. That's not going to work. And God grew angry with Moses. Attitude. 
there's some attitudes that we need. I just want you to think about them, put them up on, on the screen real quick. We're not going to talk about them, but if you want to do the work of the Lord, these are the attitudes that you need. The very first one is faith. It's been said, if one believes that he should do nothing or that he can do nothing, he will do nothing. We must have faith. In Numbers 13, the children of Israel looked at the land of Canaan, the land God promised to give them. And they said, we can't. In chapter 14 and verse 11, God says it was a problem of belief. They just didn't believe in God. If we want to be a people that is doing God's work, we need to have joy. God has given us so much. He has blessed us physically. He has blessed us in things that we don't deserve spiritually. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. People that do are people that joy in the Lord. We need to be a people of prayer. There's a connection between prayer and work. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, 38, the Lord said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send out labors in his harvest. Prayer. Prayer will give us peace. Prayer will give us strength. Prayer uh, puts us in touch with the divine in his work. Next, we need love. John 14, verse 18, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. We need to have love for the Lord, love for the lost, love for brethren. And then be persistent. Don't give up. Don't give up in the Lord's work. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We might not see what God can do in the immediate. It might take time. But God can work. And God will work if we allow ourselves to be used by him. Who does God use in his kingdom? He uses people of different personalities. He uses people of different genders. He uses people of different nationalities. He uses people of different levels of education. He uses people of different abilities. He uses different social standing, people of different social standing. He uses people of different economic standing. You see that throughout scripture. It doesn't matter who you are. God can use you. And he will use you if you present yourself to be used by him. What is some of the problems, or what are some of the problems that the church sees as we look to the future that we must conquer if we are going to continue to exist. And on the very top of that list, I find the word inactivity. I hope we can present ourselves to God to be used by him. As we close my portion this morning, again, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in, um, to listening, taking notes. Uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to speak to you uh, from God's word and uh, pray uh, God's blessing on each and every one of you individually as Christians, but also on uh, the work there at East Foothill. Thank you for listening.